So today I'm going to talk about uh, about my uh, PhD uh, dissertation, which is a physiological uh, computing to improve human robot collaboration using uh, human control uh, index. So it has been just to give you a heads up. It has been two years. I haven't given a presentation in person. I'm kind of a bit nervous. Just let you know. Just a second. My pointer is not working. Please work. Happy Pi Day, everyone. Today is a Pi Day. We just want to celebrate. So, to just first, I already talk about it, but I am a PhD candidate at RIT and working in the human robot collaboration. And I did my background in computer engineering. And then work as a software engineer in the industry, and then come to RIT in 2013, do my uh, master degree, and then work for one and a half year in a local company as a uh, software engineer. And then since then, I'm working uh, towards my PhD, and I had the chance to teach two courses at RIT. One is advanced programming, and the other one is the bio robotics. And the interesting fact about me, I don't like to repeat stuff, I automate them. That's one thing about me. So today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> what's my motivation, what is the physiological computing uh, is, mostly the challenges I face during the data collection and the designing this uh, whole uh, project. And the one idea that we come up, how can we calculate the uh, comfort index and uncomfortable index? And then I will propose you show you that, and I will give you show you some video that how I'm estimating in real time. So my motivation is robots are everywhere, and we see it all our part of daily life. As you can see, some robotic robots become in the kitchen cooking food for us, and in industry, robots are working along the co-workers to assemble part. So when the robot working together, so now we should make the person more comfortable and much safer. So to do that, we need to have a better standard to use and physiological signals. So that is all about that my research is going to be, and. What this physiological computing is, physiological computing using a human physiological signal to abstract something valuable that we can improve the system. So in some cases, physiological system being used to take like as an input system to a computer, and it can be like a controlling in a, a prosthetic arm, so the uh, physiological signals like an opening and closing uh, a prosthetic arm, or brain computer uh, interface. And these days become a really popular and they are really new way of the big human computer interaction uh, with brain computer interface. And also we use, uh, most of us now have a uh, smart watches and then we use some sort of uh, uh, sensor feedback. These are all kind of examples and uh, is a category of the physiological computing. And one other thing is a bio cybernetic adaptation. Here is the system will use this information to adapt its environment. And that's what my research is lying into it because the robot will adapt its behavior based on the person's uncomfortability. And there are other type of things as well. And what we use in physical comp computing as an example, as a field that can be used in uh, e-learning, we use in automotives, like healthcare, even marketing, that's where you're looking at. So uh, to analyze if a product is better or et cetera. So it's everywhere and it's being used and these days it's become a much uh, cheaper to use it thanks to the higher computational uh, importational power and plus uh, better uh, machine learning algorithms. So I have a, I will show this is an example that we're talking about, but I will show you a video to make more sense. So during my master, I had a chance to work on American Sign Language. Over there, I was using uh, trying to predict American Sign Language letter to uh, to a text, uh, basically using a uh, surface CMG signal. So basically, if person wants to say hello, it will double tap and then uh, say type each letter, as you can see from here. And then basically, I will be in the background recording. I mean, uh, recording this uh, surface CMG that predict these things uh, on the fly. So there are alternatives, alternative of this approach, like using a camera or Kinect and etc. But this one it doesn't need any additional things. And basically, when you wear it on your forearm. You don't, uh, nobody will realize that you are doing it. So it's an alternative way to do it. So during my PhD, I had worked another uh, project, which is Kamafib, that it was three year project was NIH funded. So over there, we were using tablet 
to only use the frontal camera to estimate resting heart rate for the patient. So this was really important to, for uh, people who has a atrial fibrillation to have a, like an early diagnosis to, for hospitalization. So I will show, play this video to just me sitting in front of the uh, computer, the tablet. And as you can see, it is picking my uh, pulse rate only from the camera and using my skin, uh, skin color. So it was really important. We were doing everything on the fly. So everything in the real time, we didn't want to record any video. So everything is, is on the fly. Processing was a little bit challenging, but we were able to handle that using, instead of using Java, we were using C++, I mean, OpenCV to do the, the stuff. Okay, now in my research, we're coming back to exactly what we are here. So we are assuming we have an environment that human and robot work together. So they are sharing the same workspace. In the same workspace, robot has a, some behavior that's changed. It changed during the, this uh, interaction. So a robot change is this acceleration or trajectory is following and or the it is, uh, velocity and et cetera. So when they are working together and when the robot is changing this behavior, there will be some uh, responses for this input. So maybe person's heart rate is going to increase maybe the, the skin product is gonna change. So my goal, while human and robot working together, record this signal, analyze this signal, and have it as such a system, ideological computing system there, it will give me an comfortability index, or you can say uncomfortability index. Then I can give this information to the robot that the robot will adjust its behavior. So this, uh, this uncomfortability or comfortability may happen with various reasons. So it can be any of this, or may person be from something else. To be honest, in my case, I don't care why it's happening. It's more is, can I detect this uncomfortability and robot will change its behavior to make it person more comfortable. So it looks simple <laughs> in the uh, figure, but there are many components that is triggering and I, doing the data collection, et cetera. So how does our physiological signals are changing? So the way it changed in our atomic nervous system, we have a two subsystem of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So when everything is normal, so parasympathetic nervous system, the branch, just everything is normal. So it doesn't need to do anything. I mean, everything is normal. But as soon as we kind of scare or afraid or anything, what happens is sympathetic nervous system take over and some things are change our uh, body internally that we don't have a control over it. For example, our heart is start to increase or our, pu our eye, uh, the, the pupils start to dilate and our hands start to sweat. And you may face some of the these things while you are watching a movie or when you feel something. So for example, right now, because I didn't give any presentation for a long time, I start to sweat and then I'm kind of uh, in my pupil, I guess changing right now, but I'm not measuring. So, these are the things that are changing. The goal is to capture this while person working with robot and have something better that I can control the robot. So well, that's not easy. So I need to have a really better understanding how I'm going to collect the data, how multiple sensors are going to use, and synchronization of the, this information. This is just, a, the, again, the, showing you the block diagram, what we are doing. So we have a human and robot in the same environment. And we divide everything into like a three concepts, like a awareness. So in awareness, like every signal that we can have in real world and digital world that can be recorded. For example, in real world, we have a sensor, robot information and camera. And in virtual world, we have a, a digital thing that whatever the robot repeat, it has a, a corresponding in the digital world. And a human team as well. So we, anytime we can measure what's the distance between human and the robot in real time using digital twin. And so this data need to be recorded. And we have a, the intelligence part, the intelligence part where we control the robot and how the expert, what the, how is robot behaving. Basically all of the signal coming from awareness and intelligence we recorded in the storage. And now what we call is a complaints of the system here. Now we have the data, we know the robot behavior and we collected this physiological signal. So can we model this information and provide this feedback to the, the intelligence that it will adjust its behavior. So to do that, so basically 
I need to program the robot. So you need the data. It's not, in my case, not like using a, a image classification or the, uh, the, like I don't have a data set. I need to generate my own data set. So to do that, I have to program the robot and create an uncomfortable scene that, that will trigger this physiological signal. So for this experiment, I was using a, a Soya robot. And in the robot, I was checking, changing three parameters, the robot velocity, trajectory, and sensitivity. So that when the robot uh, working together, I was able to collect the data. And uh, to collect the data, uh, I because there are multiple sensors, in the next slide, I will show it that I have to have a program that is controlling everything. So with a single click, when I say start here, so a robot in the background is start, starting the robot, starting the USB camera, starting the collecting data, and everything is being saved. So to the one location. So the one other thing that I was having an issue that uh, collecting signal, signals and collecting the label for that, uh, for that signal. So I was collecting uh, the distance between human and robot in real time and the galvanic skill response, like uh, ECG signal, people dilation, that's the, all signals are attaching the, the sensors on the robot and they were different uh, devices. So to synchronize physiological signals with the, uh, the event, what is happening, I have some automated event markers. When the robot start, it was generating an, uh, an event. And when the robot is ending the experiment was generating event, these are were automated. And also I have a, some manual one that I was controlling. Just go back to here, like for me, a collision happened that thanks God never happened, but take a look was important things. I need to look at it after the uh, experiment and like ignore there are some parts I need to ignore. So for data collection, what I realized that for in two experiment, the collecting, uh, label after the trial, it was really bad idea for me because a trial was taking two to three minutes. So asking person how comfortable they are and how safe they are, it's really that something has changed in the past, but now they're reporting it. So that's why I designed this, this uh, Android tablet that while they are working with robots, they were with a single click, they were reporting how they found. And so now I have a basically windowing that made by user that I, by subject that I can uh, label my signal. So this is an example where the robot is changing it is uh, behavior. For example, at this one robot bring the, the part here and the subject assemble it and report how they feel. And now you will see robots gonna do the extreme behavior like a coming from the top. So that it will create some uncomfortability that I can record. That was one of my biggest problems that how can I make person less comfortable, like a scared, not scared, make that uncomfortable that they can capture that. And in the same time, as you can see, I was recording people, I was recording GSR, and I would have a better video I would show you. That show, that show this one to only show you how I was collecting a signal. So as I was saying, the data collection was really the, the most, uh, one of the most difficult part. So I had, uh, multiple sensor, like a bio harness, this device that I was collecting ECG signals, and this device to collect the uh, galvanic skills response. And the person was wearing uh, uh, glasses to report pupil uh, dilation. And we have a motion capture system that as soon as the person moves in the lab anywhere, we, were, we know where the person is. So collecting this old device and synchronization, that was, was the problem, that, but thanks God, uh, there was an existing solution to synchronize the signal, something called lab stream layer that uh, I was plugging and writing a uh, component for them to collect the signal. So some devices were already uh, supported the LSL stream, but for some of them, for this one, I had to write the uh, code to send data to lab stream. So basically the way this user interface works, it looks simple, but in the background doing a lot of things. So this is the UI. As soon as I, the UI has a capability to enter the subject information, generate the event uh, marker, like a, the, which trial I'm going to run. And that was also able to give me to randomize it to remove the order effect as well. And I can choose any trial I want and then put the subject information and how long it's going to run. And when I hit the start, basically it would start the USB cam, IP cam, start the robot, 
and crippled information. And there were two other devices, they were always sending signal that shimmer and hard, the bio harness that it was getting data and then everything was recorded. Now I have the data and I'm going to uh, use it. So one thing when I was collecting data I faced as a problem was, you think you're collecting data, but do you really think the data is coming in? Sometimes because subject is moving and et cetera. So you have to watch the uh, data stream and if it's coming in real time. So there were some, I mean, LSL was great that collecting signal and synchronization, but actually it doesn't give me a tool to visualize the data. So something we use in robots called robot operation system. Over there was a really nice tool, something called plot juggler that I can display the signal in real time as it comes to it. But to do that, I have to write my own relay, get the, all the data from the LSL stream, right, and, and relay a program that uh, take each of them in real time and push it to rows that I can visualize it. It was painful. I end up writing a plugin for this tool uh, to write, the, I mean, plot the code right away from the LSL. And this is now open source. In case you want to use it, it's on the GitHub. So as I was saying, I did three experiments, but the last one was the most important one. The first two, I was collecting data after the trial. So basically when you collect after the trial, you don't know what's happening. And I lose the information when the person is not comfortable and it was really not that helpful. So what I did was, I was explained earlier that I ask the subject more often how they feel uh, comfortable they were reporting uh, their responses with a single couple taps so this is a video i think should have started okay that in real time when the person is standing here is it play sorry okay there's some the subject is in the workspace. I have external camera to observe what the subject is doing. And these are the, all the physiological signals coming in real time <clears throat> that I'm collecting. And I can know what this pupil dilation is any given time. And I can know what the person is looking at. And as you can see, uh, there are some automated events that any given time, I know where the person is in the room. So this is also in a, a is a good information to know for the future uh, thing. And also because robot was running in a, what we call the dynamic speed and separation algorithm. So robot was changing its behavior from normal to reduce, reduce to stop based on the based on the distance. So that I any given time I know when does the robot change in this uh, state. So that is also is being recorded. So this is kind of the whole things coming together for the data collection. So now we have data, we have the label. How do we calculate the comfortability index? So, according to James Lange theory, it says physiological changes, the changes are prior, and the emotions are experienced from that uh, physiological change. And it was saying each physiological is each emotion generate a, a unique uh, signature in the physiological. Uh, physiological signature. So, so, and then in 1980s, James Russell, that's what's called emotional wheel and, or circle flex model. They proposed the idea any emotion can be represented as an arousal and balance. So the balance is can be from negative to positive and the balance is can be like a low to high. In this case, I put the negative and positive, but they ch change it. And, Basically now for me, I mean, where this approach being used uh, is being used. One of the data set is a uh, really common data set known in for motion recognition is a effect map. So over there, they show, they use this tool to label the images. So basically they show the image to the, the people, person who is labeling the data, and then they choose what emotion is as a, a discrete, uh, category, plus they were selecting the arousal and the balance accordingly. So, and they, that's the, how they collect data. And in 2021, 
Fossil et al. They published a paper in Nature that estimating arousal and violence in real time and detecting emotion. So I guess so far you, you kind of see where I'm going from because where I'm going from is we will use emotion and arousal violence try to detect the, the comfortability. So as you can see in this example, they look at only face and then from the face using this data set and there was one more and they were detecting arousal violence in real time in circle factor. I was telling what emotion is. So, but in my case, I'm not trying to detect emotion. I'm trying to look at if the person is comfortable and uncomfortable. And Alana at all did an experiment over 150 people about uh, uh, social robotics that person, they were reporting their emotion while they are interacting with robot over video. And then what they realized that comfortability is not the emotion, it's a combination of multiple emotions. So taking from that, so now I was thinking, okay, if the comfort is not emotion, then how can I put the uh, comfortability on the circumflex model? So is the axis is somewhere here or there or where? So now I need to find it. And maybe it's, it's somewhere between like this two emotion or the comfort is somewhere there. So that was the one thing now I need to look for to uh, uh, calculate the comfortability and uncomfortable. So in proposed approach, during the data collection, we ask uh, for emotion plus the comfortability. So I was asking them how spread they are, they were reporting it, how anxiety they feel when working with robot, and how calm and how bored they are. So with the tablet, they were reporting it between uh, the value they were asking between zero to one as a continuous value. So now for me, I know that comfortability is a combination of the uh, emotion. And I know that if the person is comfortable, cannot be anxiety. So that's why for the comfortability, I selected the, the boredom, calmness, and surprise to calculate where the comfortability is. And for uncomfortability, I know that if the person is for to be uncomfortable, surprise, anxiety, and that's an error that should be boredom. I was not using that one in this paper. Uh, if using surprise, anxiety, and boredom, basically, to calculate, go to AV domain, and then look for what are the emotions. I will show you next slide to make more sense. But basically, to, to summarize, uh, for comfortability, I use these three emotions. And for uncomfortability, I use other three emotions, surprise, anxiety, and boredom. So the way I go from uh, emotion to AV domain. So now I never, I didn't ask them their arousal level. I didn't ask them their balance level. So now can I go from emotion to the AV domain? So, and I was using, I was uh, using this, this emotion are reported uh, in the literature that this work it looked like it's going to be and surprise and anxiety and boredom. So to make it more uh, like, because I don't know exact location, I put the random noise around those uh, emotion. Basically it can be anywhere in this yellow region and similarly for others as well. So now can I use, my goal was, okay, using, for example, uh, taking, it's a, in a, uh, geometric space, so the axis, the balance, and the uh, y is arousal. So can I take the average combination of those and find the actual arousal and balance? So that was the average approach I took as a first. So basically in balance, because you know, the x axis, it was taking reported value, taking that product of cosines because it is a x axis and taking average of the reported value. Now I have a, a balance component of the, that reported uh, three emotions. And similarly, I did the same thing with the uh, arousal as well. Now, using this, I have a one point in AV domain. So now, given that AV location, let's say it's here, and then given the axis, let's say this is the comfort, comfort axis. Now, how do I calculate the comfortability? 
So in a circumflex model, it say that when you are close to the origin, this means you don't feel any emotion. And when you go away from the uh, going away from the origin, this uh, emotion is uh, strength is increased. So for me, I took the, the same approach. Basically, if uh, assuming disease and uh, comfortability or uncomfortability access, and if I know the uh, position of the this uh, in the AV domain, and I based on how far it is from the the axis, I either choose the, the D1, the how far it is, this is going to be the, the comfort or uncomfortability value, or uh, if it is far away from the, the axis, I choose to like a, a, be D2, the projection, plus a penalize based on the how far is it from this axis. So then this will give me the how the some sort of the comfortability, uh, comfortability value. So given location and access, I can calculate it. So, but now I have a multiple of them I, for data collection. I need to know where the comfortability or uncomfortable access is. So I use the given formula to optimize the, where it is given angle. So basically I try to find where the angle is. And when I use my data, data points for comfortability, because people reported many location for comfortability. So when I, this each point is calculated based on three emotions. So when I fit my data and optimize it, I see that the comfortability is somewhere here. It's close to calmness. When that makes sense, because in order to be comfortable, it should be calm. You shouldn't feel like anxiety or uh, surprise. So similarly for uncomfortability, that it was ending up like a 103 degrees somewhere here in AV domain. So for this one, I was using three emotions, and for uncomfortability, I was using that emotions. So now I have this comfortably uncomfortably. I want to compare based on their. Uh, okay, that was the part one. Sorry, uh, but these are all based on subjective uh, responses. But now, when the person and robot working together, you don't want to keep asking the persons how they feel and etc. So can I estimate these things from the physiological signal and adjust robot behavior, behavior from there? So I use my the signals I collected and pre-process my data, basically remove the artifacts and the high frequency components, and just EDA. I did everything for all three signals. And I apply windowing, but this window is not sliding window. It is the when the subject is report this, uh, reporting thing, when they press the tablet, they report it. So, and I put like a six, uh, seven seconds before and second se uh, seven uh, seconds after. Now I have a, a window of those signals represent by those label. And then now I apply feature extraction, it's some time domain and frequency domain uh, features from there. And now I have my X in machine learning and Y. And any algorithm you want to use, you can do this, this experiment and a regression program that is going to uh, estimate. Uh, so in my case, I use random force and neural network to estimate what you say I am estimating emotions. So basically when I estimate emotions from this physiological signals, because now I know where the circumflex will, I know where the comfort axis is, I know where the uncomfortable axis is. Uh, so basically, I can measure and estimate what the value is. And then I can use this information for the robot. So when I uh, test my algorithm on the data set, please just focus on the table right now, that random forest and the neural network, that these are RMS uh, E and mean absolute error for surprise, anxiety, boredom, and calmness, that's what I'm using for the circumflex model. So in circumflex, Flex model, I only estimate comfortability and uncomfortability. But when we look at the their RMS value for the circumflex model for RF and NF, uh, neural network, I see that the, the error is higher. So yeah, I would say when you look at the number, yeah, I would say, yes, it is doing worse than circumflex model. That's what I was thinking. But when I was plotting my data for one trial for as a robust test, I see that 
the rank uh, uh, like uh, estimating uh, directly from physiological signals comfortability and comfortability is giving me more this is in this case uh, the orange and the green one so it's giving me like a like a, something average and similar thing with orange as well i mean that's been really better it's not able to capture the that's the changes in uncomfortability so in the why is uncomfortability and this is time during the trial so when i look at the, the circumflex models the for rf and, uh, and nn so let's look at the red one so as you can see the variation is capturing more and it especially here is doing really good so when the comfort is really high i was able to uh, capture estimate it before that and similarly here i mean it is high but it's able to pick up the uh, uh, the, the peak so that it was really important so now i can set my threshold somewhere like a 0 0.3 anything is going to be above that robot will react to it and anything's below said so that robot will not react to it so this one is i now i have my model i have my signals are coming in real time i basically replay one of my trial to estimate the comfort comfortability so the data is coming in real time i'm getting the data as a uh, ring ring buffer and pre-processing on the real time and feature extracting and transformation applying scaling and giving my model that train and then look at the uh, this is wrong i should uh, fix this one and uh, est estimating in a comfortability so in this video, I'm getting GSR, ECG, and pupillometry information. While robot is working, I can see the person's uh, pupil dilation and where the person is looking at, I think entering this information. I have an external camera that look at the, the person's face. And here is the, this gauge or what is the person is entering and reporting it. And this is my model that estimating comfortability is not uncomfortable here. So, and here basically what I'm, uh, as the data come in every uh, 10 seconds is make a new estimation for comfortability. As you can see, it's changing. And here I'm showing the, uh, the perceived CI where the person is, what the person reported and estimated is in green. And I want to move a little bit further to make. So, as you can see, as the time goes more, so the algorithm was able to pick the person's uh, comfortability. So the table previously showed you was uncomfortable, but this is showing comfortability. I haven't recorded video for the uncomfortability yet. And now it is working in real time. So for me to, how I'm gonna use this, how I'm going to do make the robot. So. We have in our lab, my previous colleague was working on dynamic speed and separation. So in dynamic speed and separation, based on the uh, human distance to the robot, robot change its uh, state, as I was initially saying, from normal to reduce, reduce to stop. So now to integrate the CI, I mean, or on CI to the, this system is going to be a kind of a scalar to his algorithm. So for the directed speed, and for cushioning distance. So what effect it will have on DSS is, if the person is comfortable, it will has no effect on the DSS. It will work as it is. But as soon as the person is feeling less comfortable, that it will think that robot will slow down easy, uh, early, and then it will keep the cushioning distance larger. So that will keep person is more comfortable. So. And for this experiment, now I'm about to uh, collect the data. It's kind of giving me my final experiments to validate my algorithm versus normal DSS. So I changed things a little bit more uh, complex or more realistic, to be honest. So in the, one problem we have in the lab research is lab research. So the things are not in real world. So what I end up doing, we have now two robots working together one is providing tarp and putting over, over the conveyor that the noise you hear, the robot is moving, you, the subject will feel it's like in a factory, things that working with the robots. So this robot's pick item put in the conveyor and conveyor moves, there's a sensor here that stop and this other robot pick the, item, uh, pick the item and put in the table one. And 
the, the subject job is start, start from here, move this table, pick one part, and move this table, pick the part that robot provided, and cross the danger zone, because this is not, not a location that uh, it's gonna, the, or the day workspace is gonna overlap, and then move it to here, pick the last part, assemble it, and drop it here. So now the robot will work, uh, I mean, I will I design my uh, algorithm such that the, the subject is going to face with the two different modalities. One is DSS and what DSS with CI, but of course it wouldn't will, will know and it's going to grade accordingly. And I'm going to like validate my algorithm, see if it's work. Does it really make the person less comfortable? And how much this is going to affect on the productivity? But one thing I talk too much is this arousal balance, arousal balance, arousal balance, calculating from the uh, Emotions. When I calculate the distance from emotion, this is one way to averaging it, and it's not like a, a given formula. It's just me to calculate. But one thing people do to ask the subject how what is their arousal uh, balance and arousal level. That's what going to, I'm going to ask them. And this last experiment will allow me to see correlation between arousal and balance and emotions. And I don't, from this one, I will no longer need to calculate the, this from the emotions. I can directly plug into and find it uh, in my comfortability and comfortability access. So this is one improvement I added my data collection that I will be collecting it. And thank you so much.